For the players, the pop culture as PlayStation podcast is fueled by the man shake. I lost 30 kilos in 10 months using this meal replacement shake. If you want to support the show and Max and my weight loss journey, or to even start your own, click the link in the description below. The man shake, real blokes, real results. For the players. I'm Ryan Betson. I'm Max Cooper. And this is for the players, the pop culture is PlayStation podcast. But today it is not a regular episode, Max. It is a special episode. It is a PAX radio presented by Audio Technica. Specially made episode. And you can't have a special episode without bringing in some special guests. And we have two friends. Two friends that, you know, one that we chat to all the time. One we haven't heard from in like a millennia. But it's it's awesome. So we've got ex PlayStation podcast host, but current friend of ours, Paul James Games. What's up, Paul? Uh, where, where are the special guests? I, I was told there was going to be special guests, but it's just myself and uh, yeah. Well, Joel, Joel's pretty cool. Yeah, you're the special guest because you are still the most the the what, what's the the most regular, recurring most guest. recurring guest. And of course, we haven't heard his voice, we haven't seen his face in a very little while, but we are very happy to have him back in general, and then to have him back even more on the show. It's Joel Grolton from And Again. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me back. So good to hear your fucking voice. So good. But as I said, you know, for this for this special Pax Online episode, we are going to do something a little bit different but also not really. It's still in the PlayStation vein, but we're going to look a bit more uh, a bit more focused, a bit more honed in. And we're going to talk about the state of PlayStation, where they're at now, where what it looks like in the future, and we're breaking it down in its little parts. Now, Padge is already giving me hand signals, just like regular packs in person. He may have to bounce at any minute. Oh, Normally, there's shit on the show floor that I've got to go see. He's a busy man. He's got to <laughs> run around and go do things and, you know, kiss hands and shaking babies. So uh, <laughs> we've, we've, <laughs> we've only got him for a small window of time. But we it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a show, uh, a special show without having Padge in. So we, we got him. For, we'll get him for the quick amount of time that we have. How do you, like, in a very short summary, how, how do you think the state of PlayStation is right now? Padge, you're first because you're on time. Look, things are humming. They're, they're riding on the, the wave of success from the PS4. I think that's pretty obvious to everyone. Uh, Xbox is doing some great work to catch themselves up. But fuck those guys. They're the competition and we're not talking about them today. Um, <laughs> there, there are some optical things that have been a concern for a little while now. Obviously, you know, we've heard about the indies. We've some walking back of mixed messaging when it comes to things like the Horizon Zero, uh, sorry, Forbidden West uh, pre-order or cross-gen sort of thing. Like there's, there's little things, little rakes that they're stepping on, but nothing really of any sort of substance. I understand, and I guess you know, Ryan. I get for anyone who who's listening to Pax Radio today who hasn't or hasn't previously followed Pop C related content. You and I did a stream on on your channel, the Twitch stream, for the recent PlayStation Showcase, and you and I we even did. debated a little bit about what was going on with the first parties there. And I've got a whole bunch of thoughts that I'm going to roll out on you before I disappear. Look, overall, things are in a good place. There are some little things that need polishing up, but nothing that I think is going to result in them being, for want of a better phrase, overthrown this generation that will still be the king no i think uh it's only in a pretty strong spot obviously the state of the world is probably not what was planned when they started releasing the the ps5 and things like that and had things in their pipeline of what to release uh but i think things are looking fairly strong on the horizon and uh yeah obviously with a, a lot of their studios probably coming out with things over the next few years it will be interesting to see in future when we get more of those kinds of future of playstation like announcements when we're getting uh, kind of those gaps filled because at this at this point it's kind of a you can kind of see the tent poles that they're putting up but kind of they need to kind of fill in the tent a bit but yeah it's pretty exciting what about yourself max uh similar to to what joel just mentioned about the the, the state of the world that it's in at the moment it would be very interesting to see how sony handled their cross-generation gap without a global pandemic i think this supply shortage has played a massive role in them having to make that decision of what's all our new stuff will also be coming to the last generation of consoles and you know it it's this they've put themselves or they haven't put themselves in the position but it's they're in a position where those of us who who are lucky enough to have a current gen console are being 
almost held back by those who can't get one at the moment and it's a very weird place to be in because i think this is this is one of the, f- the first times they've really done such a large cross generation i agree with you you guys all there like as you said there's a lot of things they're doing they're doing incredibly well but there are a lot of things that are that are have a room for improvement or the ability to be critiqued so you guys hit a lot of those beats there whether it be about the cross gen thing uh the pandemic how the pandemic uh got involved the availability of the consoles themselves but one thing that you all mentioned as well was around the communication from playstation so they've had this really hit and miss strategy of uh playing the cards close to their chest not revealing anything unless they absolutely have to and then when they have done it's kind of been a little lackluster in some ways in some ways really strong but also kind of flat so Padgett, once again, comes to a very t- time sensitive for you. How are you finding their communication? Look, they're walking back uh, things when they mess up, which is good. Like it's it's not this, uh, they haven't got the blindness on. They're not oblivious to the feedback that they're receiving. Case in point, the Horizon thing, or even the PS3 Vita uh, stores being turned off fiasco as well. Now, oh, you know, you can, you can you can drop your conspiracy theories and maybe suggest they always planned these things and it was to, to kind of make themselves look like a good guy PlayStation. I don't buy into any, any of that sort of stuff. You've, it's, it's a fine line to walk when you're, play, uh, when you're messing with the hearts and minds of your community and your fans. So you don't try and play little games and tricks to try and win them over. Uh, it's just too risky. You know, once bitten, all those sort of things. You can only screw around with people so many times before they eventually push back on you. I don't think they're playing any deliberate games with people. I think there's some genuinely clumsy mistakes but to their credit they are walking them back and i think that is the most important thing while we are talking about communication jim ryan's hopeless i need to i need to say that because if i'm talking about playstation i need to make sure that i hang shit on jim ryan he just he just seems so out of step with everyone like just can we can we just let herman speak to us like even the the Mm. showcase recently they had to give jim some spotlight why why do we need jim ryan he he, it's now i understand that uh, there's a larger portion of the community that aren't us the hardcore that are pursuing the news day in day out but they couldn't care less whether it's jim or herman so you may as well get someone Mm. like herman who is going to be able to speak to every single portion of the audience put him at the forefront bring back shoe uh all those sort of cool things like they did such a great job in the early ps4 days about leveraging the personalities to build their their brand Mm -hmm. and that's completely yeah exactly yeah shoe uh well, with that in mind, because as you said, like PlayStation were really good at having those faces, pardon me, within the corporate structure in order to kind of humanize the company in, in a lot of ways. Something, things that we saw, you know, the likes of Tesla with Elon Musk and Steve Jobs over at Apple, like they are what ground a company. Max, do yeah. you think they're missing out right now by not having the, uh, they have faces, quote unquote, but not the good faces than the likes of Sean Layden and Shuhei and Geo, like Joel said. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because like Padge said, for us, we're looking for something like that, but the general consumer would probably just prefer a Nintendo Direct style showcase every other month. Like that disembodied they just, voice. Yeah, they just, they, just want, they just want that narration over what's coming and they, they, they're looking more towards, you know, what's coming out soon. Let me see what you've got in the, in the works. Whereas we're looking for something more there you know we're not after the we're not just after the what's coming next but we also want to know what's going on behind the scenes what are those acquisitions that you are looking at how are they going to benefit you guys in the future when we're, we're looking for something deeper than the general consumer because like yeah especially when you in terms of min, of, of uh, minimized conversation right as said like the people are wanting those directs but those directs themselves are incredibly infrequent and they mm. kind of come out with such little fanfare or also come out on the back of other news. An example being like when they when they announced a lot of PS5 news on the same day the Concrete Genie came out, they have a really interesting way of burying mm. shit with other things. They, so they it, also give almost no time between the announcements of their showcases and when they're actually happening, or the state of plays and then when they're happening. It's like they know that they don't have that much to show, so they're not letting people have enough time to hype themselves up to be let down. Joel, do you think that's the case? Do you think it is they don't have anything to show and that's why they're quiet, or are they trying to play coy? 
No, I don't think so, because uh, the Nintendo Directs follow the exact same model, and like whether it's the, as we've seen over the last few months, every single month without fail, there was that always the leaks from apparent insiders saying, oh, it's coming this month, there's going to be this Sony show, and we get hyped regardless. Like, it, it wouldn't matter if they gave you a little bit of time or what, but like the Nintendo Directs typically only give you a couple of days as well, and people go crazy, so I think that's where we end up shooting ourselves in the foot, is we run off with all these ideas of what we want to see and realistically it was probably never on the card uh, I, I don't think so i think it's just kind of going into things with tempered expectations and hopefully coming out surprised that's well, cute I, tempered expectations <laughs> well because i think that's part of that's I, i'm with you guys in terms of that of that space right like i think the communication has been incredibly poor in terms of i i originally was quite pro the idea of say something when you have something to say however their complete and utter silence is baffling and then when you've got the likes of jim ryan coming out and making comments and making claims that have no substance to them right they're like oh what are you mm. like why are you saying that what you know there's like there's there is a difference between what he's saying and what the actions that are being taken and like as you, you know, paul like he reads like someone that isn't a game player right well, and we'll he notice every time he me, uh, every time yeah. he talks about an upcoming title like you know what jim what are you playing at the moment in an interview and it's always the most recent release he reminds me a lot of the steve buscemi hey fellow kids kind a of every good. time he <laughs> yeah like every time he comes on there he doesn't <laughs> tread that same line that sean Layden would have where it seemed like he would do the corporate kind of stuff have you played well, ribbon as well as yeah as well as do that kind of stuff and really talk to the consumers like it doesn't seem to tread that line as naturally it seems a little bit robotic <laughs> Yeah, and, I, and then you talked about like the hype of coming around these showcases and these state of plays, right? And the, I think you were spot on with the complete quiet that they are doing. They are creating this incredible hype around whatever these state of plays or whatever this showcase becomes. And I think this recent showcase is an example. When you're essentially funneling everything into one point of the year, very similar to the old E3 model, people expect to be blown the hell away from that showcase. Mm. And especially when it comes to the likes of first-party studios. You look at that, and this is that moment to shine. PlayStation are known for their exclusive. They're known for their first-party releases. And if we look at what the first parties have in them now, apparently it's just Marvel and it's just Insomniac. Very are you well. with me on that? Or are you... Are you thinking no, no, more? this is this is the thing that I'm flat against you on. So firstly, I think the, the Marvel stuff, so the Insomniac titles, the upcoming ones there, that is simply a byproduct of Marvel being Marvel. Uh, we got those announced as early yeah. as we did because that's how Marvel rolls with their MCU and everything in that space. They want nice long lead time on that. They want mm. marketing to up the arse. They want you to be thinking about these things for a, from a long way out. That's that's how they roll in that space. With that information in mind and knowing what we know, thanks to the likes of Jason Schreier and others who've you know reported on this stuff, throughout the course of the year, we heard about what was happening at Bend. We heard about what was happening at Naughty Dog. We heard about what was happening at the team run by Michael Mumbauer and uh, so the kind of assistance studio that was kind of well they help anyone and everyone within the first party there we kind of had a good idea of where a fair few of these studios were at and so we couldn't really set our expectations too high for some of those and then there is obviously the pandemic on top of the whole thing i think the fact that insomniac was working with two more marvel titles meant that marvel needed those wanted those things to be announced nice and early it took all the heat off the other first parties in terms of actually maybe announcing something earlier than they should I mean, look what's happened with God of War now. As, as it so happens today, we learned a little bit about the circumstances around what happened with God of War and Christopher Judge and his injury, and that's actually played a big part in the, the delay of the title. Whether that's the entire thing, I doubt it, because there was, again, a pandemic in there. His injuries were in 2019. The, the Marvel factor, the Insomniac factor, has created some time where whatever Naughty Dog's title is next or whatever we see uh, from Pixel Opus or whatever we see from a host of other studios... There's no rush to fire anything out there. And then you think about what we've seen from someone like Sucker Punch, for example, who've only just recently rolled out the director's cut, but also before that, before Ghost, uh, but in between the, uh, the director's cut and Ghost, we also saw a whole multiplayer mode from them as well. For the most part, these first party studios have actually been churning them out at still a fairly rapid rate. Insomniac is just a powerhouse and making everyone look bad in comparison. Like they're just such a well-oiled machine. But I, I think everyone else is performing quite well. I don't know. It, it, it's it's a weird one. I think what they've strategically done is they've perhaps recognised though that okay, we're we're not going to show off these other first party titles. We're not you're not going to see what's next from Naughty Dog. Or you're not going to see what's next from Bend or whoever it happens to be. So we'll get third parties involved. So we'll lock down Final Fantasy VII remake into grade. 
maybe add an extra year to that. We'll lock down Final Fantasy 16. We'll lock, lock down for Spoken. We'll lock down KOTOR. We'll lock down all these. Again, the, the majority of consumers don't go, that's a Sony first party title. They go, that's a PlayStation exclusive. So they look at that and go, sweet, I can play KOTOR only on this. I'm buying a PlayStation. You're 100% then, spot on. The average person doesn't really understand like the connection between a first party release, a second party, or a third party exclusive. Like, like yeah. that, that, there is such a difference between the lot. They just see it as being exclusive to PlayStation. So they, so this is perfectly done given the hand that Sony's got at the moment with studios releasing games in and just before the pandemic. The timing wasn't great for a lot of their first party studios. And so they've been able to fill in the gaps with some really strategic temporary, presumably, acquisitions. So well, with, with that in mind, so Joel, like, where, where are you think, what do you think the future of the exclusives are currently sitting? Because we, we look at this and, and as I said, like we, we can essentially see what the next six-ish months are in terms of, oh, Padge has given the wave, he's, he's got to bounce. I've got a boot. I've got a, an appointment with Horizon Forbidden West uh, on the show floor. So I'll Absolute let you know how that goes worst. sometime in the future. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Absolute worst. What a bite. <laughs> Joel, about, as I said, because in terms of, if we, I do believe Patch has an incredible point there about Disney coming in and essentially saying, hey, we want to get the lead out on these nice and early. And I understand that, you know, we've talked about on the show, like Max and I, about the idea that not announcing a release date or anything too early uh is is you know sorry is a, is a very much a bad thing but if we look at what PlayStation have in the from an ex, from a first party standpoint because we'll get to second party stuff shortly it's pretty quiet after march or potentially yeah. june yeah, of next year yeah you're not wrong and i think a large part of that is obviously with the rollout of ps5s as we were discussing a little bit off the air in regards to obviously the uh, the install base of people that can have a PS5 at the moment dwarfs probably the amount that they wanted to have in the market or even obviously to the PS4s that are currently available. So it, it makes absolute sense from a business standpoint to obviously target the $100 million, uh, sorry, the hundred million consoles you've already got out in the wild, which is why I think the tale of cross-gen has kind of gone on a little bit longer than they probably expected. But I think they're also holding their cards because what the next studios are probably working on now aren't coming to PS4 and they don't want to also have that conversation around, well, here's what's coming, but a lot of people still can't get it. And it's also probably, I think, what's personally attributed to the trend of director's cuts, giving these studios some time to be able to obviously work with the new hardware, get a game out, and obviously it still looks like Sony are releasing things, but... I think it's also filling in the kind of future calendar in regards to looking like they don't have anything coming out. So kind of give the consumers something to play on their PS5s. But I think that's personally what may have led to this kind of trend that we're seeing with kind of your, your paid for re-releases and your, your new content. Give the developers something to work for while they're obviously working behind the scenes on pre-production and a lot of the, the work going into probably things that won't be coming to, to PS4. But I think at this stage, it's kind of just been a little bit disrupted and probably hasn't gone to plan. But I think once I kind of get that, uh, there'll be a point where the kind of floodgates may reopen. And I really hope that it's sometime next year. But uh, I think it all depends on getting those uh, PS5s in people's hands. Because I think the other difficulty that they've had as well is around the idea that like there are they a lot of their big studios kind of blew their load at the back end of the PS4. Right, as in, so if we look mm -hmm. at the last couple of years of the PS4 in terms of it, of PlayStation first parties, like we're seeing the likes of Naughty Dog and Santa Monica, even Santa Monica are doing something semi soon, uh, you know, and like Insomniac is still kill, killing it. Like Bend, who, who then, as we know from the back, from the from the behind the scenes sort of things, has been oddly yep. redistributed. Like the 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 a lot dreams of dreams came out. Yeah, dreams finally came out. And <laughs> they released like of, one game a generation at this yeah, point. Everyone sort <laughs> so. of forgot about it already. Like Pixel Opus is still quiet, but they're a team of like twelve people, so there's not a whole lot for them to do. Yeah, San Diego, San Diego are still releasing MLB the show, you know, and there has been some some recent acquisitions as well. But as with most acquisitions, we won't see any fruits to that purchase for at least a couple of years. Now, like Max, they are still releasing three. Uh, exclusive first party exclusive next year it just looks that maybe the first half of the year so if they if they fill in the rest of the year with these second party deals do you think that's enough to bide them over until as joel said the ps5s are in more hands it's hard to say so 
I think they're three really strong releases that they've got coming out because they've got what what is it GT Seven Horizon Forbidden West and the the possibility of of God of War and Forbidden West and GT Seven are launching on top of each other in the first quarter. That kind of mm. seems crazy to me. You know, that puts into my mind of, okay, well, God of War is going to be a holiday game then, but they don't want to release anything around their big third-party stuff. No one's going to launch October, November when the Call of Duties, the uh, if Battlefield goes back to being a yearly release, the Battlefields and all of those things. So I also don't think they're going to release God of War in December because they've missed all their big US holiday sale points. When are they releasing it? They can re- are they releasing that in June? Because a stacked front end of the year may put them in this awkward position, especially if they don't have those second party deals to pull them forward for those big holiday sales of consoles if they're trying to push that at the back end of next year. Now, that also depends on whether or not there are consoles for sale at the back end of next year. You know, people are saying that these these console shortages are going to run into 2023 and possibly longer. They're in this sticky situation of... They need to get their stuff out for the people that have got the consoles. And at the same time, they need to try and work out some way to get more consoles into their consumers' hands. Well, and that's the difficulty that we have is when when we're, you know, in a pandemic slash semi-post-pandemic, depending on what part of the world you choose to be in, like (laughs) there is that difficulty of like, yeah, that is just purely down to availability. Like every console that has been manufactured has been sold whether to a consumer or a scalper, but the scalpers are few and far between these days because the demand isn't as high from a scalper than they were at launch. It's not as lucrative anymore. Yeah, it's not as lucrative. So I doubt <laughs> that many people are going down that path. But like you are kind of like spot on there. You know, it's like it's not it's not looking to at least 2023 to we're going to be able to see them on the shelves readily available. And like that is going to to cause that, that challenge. But... When you look, because mm-hmm. uh, we're talking about the exclusive side of things, the first party side of things, if we look over at what Xbox were doing, and you know, and they've just picked up like 13,000 studios or whatever, they are just throwing money around to essentially not just, because they, they're not just buying studios, their entire model is buying IPs as well. So they're essentially bolstering what they have in their exclusive bracket um, in more of we're buying not the potential, but what they already have. So it kind of looks like the Sony are making that alternate decision when buying the potential of studios, especially when we look at the recent acquisition of Fire Sprite, a Fire Sprite and a second studio that was announced this week at time of recording, um, sort of to help bolster that, as well on the back of Nixus uh, and even Housemark. Housemark. Housemark certainly are within the PlayStation space of a known brand, but to the average person, they're not, they're, they are pretty unknown so they are being purchased for their potential rather than their actual value insomniac i would argue is probably the only one that was bought for value and if anything they've already they over got stolen if anything their, <laughs> oh, val- wow. their value yeah. has been completely <laughs> underpaid for do you yep. think this is the right strategy bargain. for them to have joel because like because what we hear on the internet out all there is like sony should buy square sony should buy take two sony should buy this that and that or do you think they're playing the smarter game here? I mean, that also comes down to a lot of people's kind of like hype expectations as well, probably, or it doesn't help coming off the back of uh, Microsoft not only buying like certain Bethesda studios, they went and bought like the parent company and acquired the whole suite of things. So people probably like obviously want to draw that attachment of like Square, which would be a massive get for Sony. They probably also don't understand realistically, they don't also have Microsoft money. Yeah to be able to go out and do this kind of thing. Well, yes, they're a uh, kind of massive, like well-known company and like kind of like household name when it comes to Sony and things like that. And obviously leading in regards to consoles sold in terms of the overall business, uh, they don't quite have the the same kind of level playing field to do that kind of thing, but it would be epic to, uh, don't get me wrong, to see them kind of do a big move like that. Uh, but no, I, I don't think uh, like that was initially probably what they were ever planning to do. And I think even Jim Ryan at some point said when it was going through all this Xbox stuff, like, oh, we're not going to just go out acquiring and look forward to, to now and see exactly what's happening. So I don't know if internally they've kind of changed their mind on that. But uh, you, you're not incorrect in saying that in all of these things, they're kind of buying up potential because, yeah, I don't think we're going to see 
the fruits of like what these companies are doing or maybe they're being used initially as assistance studios for for a lot of the other first parties but i think in the grand scheme of things i'm sure sony probably has a five or ten year plan for them but yeah at least right now i don't think it's uh, a massive game changer in regards to oh it's going to be next year we're now going to get 10 first party releases well, yes, yeah, certainly not, because as like you know, if you look yeah. at Microsoft's thrown all this money out for these studios, and similar to them, we're not going to see that how that comes for a while, because a lot of them were just just releasing their latest game, so there's years away there. And if we look at what Sony have done in terms of the studios that they currently own, you know, they were grown internally, like they were picked up as small studios and then grown. Naughty Dog, yes, have come off the likes of Crash Bandicoot back in the day, but they, 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 there had no way to hit their potent, like their full blown peak until this back end. Like, Sony helped support them and, and grow them. Um, like, I know we're going to shit on the, on the competition for a minute here. Max, with Microsoft, do you think they even have the history and or capability to successfully manage all these studios, especially when you compare them to PlayStation? Because if you look, you know, this is going to sound very fanboy and it's kind of unintentional it's intentional slash unintentional but if we look at the big hunk of the exclusives that playstation have made over the last five years the majority of them end up in game of the year conversation if not incredibly well critical acclaim do you think that microsoft can get there because if you look back at what they've done it's not there i mean it depends on what they're playing for it, it depends on if those studios are left to their own autonomy and are the ZeniMax studios just going to do the ZeniMax studio things because um, if that's the case, all they've done is really secured a, a an, an essentially a backer with very deep pockets and they can possibly take those risks and go out of their comfort zone a little bit. Uh, you know, you look at the likes of, um, well, Arcane just released Deathloop. Deathloop is a very similar game to Dishonored another another game by that studio but you know you look back at i think it was at the uh at jeff keely's most recent showing arcana also now doing a what was it a group looter shooter they're going they're Red moving fault. out of their comfort zone yeah, and this hmm. you know it'll be interesting to see what they can pull out of those studios and how they're going to manage those studios because you look over at Sony and you can see that some of their studios have been mismanaged. You look at the likes of, of Band who have been like, we we want to do Days Gone 2. But you can't do Days Gone 2. We need you over here to do this with these guys. But now they're not doing that with these guys. They're doing their own IP. But it's not another Days Gone. It's a, it's a brand new IP again. Everyone does at times get mismanaged. And it just depends on how on whether or not they're going to be left to make their own decisions, play to their own strengths. And yes, you're right. A lot of the times those those PlayStation first parties are in those game of the year contenders, you know, deservedly so. But it'll be interesting to see, you you know, you look at some of those games and a lot of those games over on the Microsoft side, over on those Bethesda side, they do have those game of the year editions. They are in that, they are in the talk. They might not necessarily be winners every time, but they're, they're still quality games. It's, it's a weird, it's a weird space. Like, because obviously you know like like you guys have mentioned microsoft have those deep pockets they've got enough to throw the cash whereas sony have to be a little bit smarter in their acquisition acquisitions yes they're buying smaller studios and if they can nurture them to the point of what insomniac are now what naughty dog are now then they're going to get value out of those but we are not going to see that anytime soon like the one thing that the xbox do have an like an exceptional amount of value in if that's what we're talking about is is game pass and Game Pass really is the one thing that Sony is missing out on because Game Pass is objectively fantastic. Like in terms of a consumer facing uh, value for money, though it does have its own, like a lot of potential risks and concerns about, you know, I guess from not just a financial space, but more of a, a value of a game sort of space. And that's a, bit, a much bigger narrative. But there was conversation from Jim Ryan that playstation need a game pass equivalent, or they are working on a game pass equivalent i should say sorry so joel is game pass the future is that what playstation are going to need uh, i mean it could definitely be an avenue it sounds like they're probably pursuing but like my kind of worry about it similar to what you said does it just devalue any type of game like 
when you kind of had the rise of the app store, uh, like when the iPhone launched and people stopped wanting to pay for anything that was over like 99 cents, for example, and everything just becomes a race for the bottom. And obviously then your quality gets shot and does it then hinder like game marketing budgets going forward or even production budgets going forward, for example, there is it obviously it's very, very pro consumer in regards to, to how much value is there. And obviously being able to pick up and play probably something you would never expect or being able to pick up those first party exclusive things day one. But yeah, does it devalue the the game on the other platforms that maybe it's not available for free or as it uh, obviously uh, like for the actual return for the developers, uh, what kind of things and will it then limit the scope of any games of theirs going forward because they know it's going to Game Pass. So obviously it's definitely something that could be very pro-consumer going forward and, and if game budgets have to be kind of scoped down and that's just what we get used to, then maybe, but yeah, I don't think I really want to see it. I, I like those kind of like when when like you were kind of touching on before when you put in a, a sony game something like a, a god of war or a last of us or something like that there is a kind of difference in the kind of feeling and tone and quality that you kind of feel compared to many other games that are on the market and i've always kind of wondered does that come down to what specifically like what kind of magic formula they're using whether it's like just throwing a whole bunch of money or time or uh, things like that at it because yeah you kind of wonder why all studios don't have this kind of ability to to do that or is it like down to the talent pot uh, potentially working on the games or why uh, is it so much differently in regards to programmers or artists working in one space compared to another but yeah across the whole industry obviously there's games of completely different scope but kind of getting a little bit off topic there in regards to that could be a whole different podcast for another day but yeah I'd, going back to your question I'd love to to kind of see it but I don't know if if it comes at the like to hinder the industry as a whole i probably don't want to well because one of the great things that games pass can do is shine a lot of light on independent games playstation have really lacked a lot of indie like indie game support like after especially after the, the big buzz of the ps4 it's kind of one of their big saving graces if they re if they create their own similar system in, in a games pass or a playstation now <laughs> rebranded do you think that they could bring those indies in if they make something the same like Joel mentioned, you know, it, it's great for discoverability and, you know, it does give those smaller studios an opportunity to get their games out there because a lot of them, uh, unfortunately, do get overshadowed and overlooked. Like, there are a lot of fantastic indie titles that, for the most part, will not, for the general consumer, will not see the light of day. And, you know, you look back uh, a couple of months ago and you see those stories of, how much of a pain it is to get independence on the PlayStation Store, how uh, their sales are dictated upon PlayStation. They can't set prices for their own sales on their games. They can't uh, do introductory prices. And it sounds like they're making it so much harder for these indie studios to even want to work with Sony and get their titles on their system. Because like there are, there are some parts about PlayStation that are still incredibly antiquated. And I do think side of their business practice is that and I, I guess what is what would be sort of considered relatively antiquated now would be the idea of generations like we look at you know that that's the old system this console is done move on to the next one forget the old one behind now you touched upon this at the start Joel about like that blurred line is is there currently and we look at it and I, I do agree with you on the idea of like they're not going to sell games to only 10 million people like they want to sell it to a hundred million people, a hundred and ten million people, whatever the you know whatever the number is. But one of the things we were discussing before this is like they're still going to sell their ten, they're still going to sell their ten, fifteen million copies of a game, but just not right now at launch. Like because as PS fives come out, like if we look at Miles Morales as an example, it is still a top selling game on a PS five every month since its release. Like, so it's not as if the game is not, but the games are not being sold because every new PS5 will be someone buying those games. I, even though I agree slash disagree with the business idea that down the, you know, like they're, they're, they're holding that complete transition to the next gen because of that business model and the, uh, the, you know, the money side of things. Do you think this is the right attitude because they're going to need to transition soon enough? Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, there's going to come a point, and I'm sure they've probably got uh, a time in mind, but as I mentioned, they're, they're going to have to eventually pull the plug and stop supporting both, and I think it's at that point that we start seeing a lot more about what these other studios 
are actually kind of working on. They don't want to kind of come out at the gate and show them now when obviously it could cause a, a whole bunch of different conversations about it. But there, there is going to have to be a point where they draw the line. And as you mentioned, then that kind of puts a, a fixed point on where a generation kind of lies because first parties going forward from that point are probably not going to work on both consoles or have to optimize things or uh, even earlier this week they kind of did a bit more of a showcase of how great all the tech in uh, Horizon Forbidden West is going to be and how Aloy's now got peach fuzz and all these additional details and things like that that they're now going to render in the world and they're like oh but it won't be a, a restricted uh, experience on PS4 and I just thought like to myself I'm like how what what end are you restricting there are you like there has to be back, there like, has to be some restraints somewhere yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, you're showing all this detail that you apparently couldn't do before, but the PS4 has been out for eight years. Mm. <laughs> so, like, I'm like, surely if if that's true, and then it's not just trying to not scare off the install base that's larger and probably going to pick it up, uh, then yeah, at what point are you like restricting things? Is it like, could it be amazing if you just knuckled down and made it the the best PS5 game to date, or is it? true and it's kind of just going to be the the best ps4 game to date and and, and a pretty who knows okay gonna ps5 be. <laughs> yeah who knows yeah because like and just say maybe wonder it's ballsy of them to want to talk about the idea of you know this next generation of console you know and they and they they are not willing to that like they're not willing to really go balls deep into like this next gen for business reasons but yet we're on the we're on the verge of psvr2 allegedly like, I understand they they don't use the same chipset as a console, so potentially manufacture of them isn't a concern, but it looks as if probably by the end of 2022, Max, we're going to have a PSVR 2, and I imagine it's going to take the power of the PS5 to run PSVR 2. Is this the right decision when people don't have PS5s? PSVR is a niche enough object or uh, hardware that not everyone's going to buy it. <laughs> So I don't think that's going to be an issue. I don't think of the X million console PS5 consoles that they've sold already, not everyone's going to buy a PSVR 2. So even if they are restricted, I don't think it's going to be play too much of an issue. You know, a lot of people don't like VR games. They they tend to be, you know, just from from the point of, you know, some people get motion sickness, some people want to game when they're sitting down relaxing on a couch and some PSVR titles just do not allow you to do that. I think that a, what would it be by the end of 2022 year and a half, almost two years after launch of a PlayStation five to bring out this hardware seems like a good enough time. It gives their consumers enough of the uh, gives, especially their launch consumers enough time to repony up and get back into that space. And the PS the PSVR really does need a new iteration the fact that we're still using uh, controllers from two generations ago is baffling to me. Uh, the <laughs> the 30 million cables I have to plug in to make the damn thing work is a nightmare. I would use my PSVR so much more often if I didn't have to untangle 30 million cables to plug in, find the right ports to plug them in because not all the ports are powerful enough to, to, to run the mm. damn thing. And then you've got There's the barely enough ports to run it. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have one of the newer PSVR, so at least my breaker box has a 4K output. So I can I can leave mine plugged in if, if need be, but, you know, there's there's so many things that need to be fixed with that hardware, and, you know, hopefully that gets done with this with this new iteration. They'll, they'll you know, we'll have a better uh, resolution. Uh, hopefully that will also lower the screen door effect on them which will lower people's motion sickness in them and will increase people's enjoyment of playing those games because a lot of VR titles are fantastic. They give you so much extra immersion into the title that you're playing uh, that are, it really makes the whole experience completely different. Sean Layden, I believe, was the one that said it uh, around the idea that PSVR, this is the PlayStation 1. This is the first iteration of this. And like they said, they were in it for the long haul. And I do believe that this may be the case, at least with a second version. Like the, the frequency in which we are getting strong and steady releases uh, of uh, PlayStation VR titles kind of questions its long its longevity. Is it worth them sticking to it, Joel? I am one of the people that are in the camp of PSVR. Like I've 
picked it up on launch and absolutely loved it like you can't beat that immersion when you actually get like in the game with something that you're absolutely loving but you, you're not wrong like when i can't even think of the last psvr game that's come out that i've actually played or like uh, had much hyper marketing around it iron but man also VR. just while max that was, was the last, talking that, iron man the last, VR. Okay, that, so that was the last was one may, they may last gen- genuinely year. pushed that was like may or march last year yeah it was, it was right just before like, uh, last of us yeah and then before that it was massive spell of nothing but also like to, to max's point there i was just thinking while he was uh, like Talk, raising some good points there is also to touch on what you said before maybe they we haven't seen a lot of those kinds of what's ahead in the future there because they could be psvr2 titles and it, it makes no sense to actually show them yet because yeah i just thought in my head that uh obviously if they're you, you're going to want some first party studios probably working on something and yeah you got to got to have something to show for this thing obviously when you announce it and probably upon launching it so it's got to be in the works so I mean, uh, I'm the, pretty excited. The but. other thing is with a with an upgraded rig, you can get third party stuff. Like a lot of the stuff that runs on Quest and Steam VR and all that fun stuff does not work on will, will not work on a PSVR as it stands now. On a PSVR yeah. two, sure you can get those Halo, uh, um, Halo, bloody Half Life, <laughs> Alex, and Alex, yeah. all those all those fun stuff because they will work. You know, we've, we now have a beefier system to run our VR. We're going to have more compatible controllers to play in that space. And I think it's going to open them up to be able to, you know, work with a lot of other third-party studios and bring some of those games across. Like we've seen some of the PlayStation-exclusive VR games go across. Why can't we get it the other way as well? And up until oh, now, it has been a hardware restraint. Yeah, absolutely. But to also, like double back on that as well i don't see sony probably coming out of the gate showing off this brand new console and probably having a launch lineup that was hey here's things that you could have played two years ago on that other thing i think they need to come out and kind of wow people with this is why you need this thing because with that in mind like i understand that there is there was at least a pressure on the first part get to go back to the first party space right so we had gorilla cambridge who we did rigs and they kind of focused rigs, very yeah. heavily on psvr and i believe sony london was doing the same as well but that's uh that's not the case anymore and even then there was that secret manchester studio which were working on a psvr VR game and they that studio got kind of canned before they even announced that they were working on a vr title what we heard was some sort of search and rescue release I, I think that brings in a lot of questions around just the future of PlayStation in general in terms of some of the decisions that we're, that we're seeing. Like, once again, a studio being canned before they even announce something. Uh, we look over, as as uh, Max mentioned earlier, with Bend being repurposed, like a full-blown studio being repurposed to do Naughty Dog's pickup work with, uh, you know, Last of Us and Uncharted remasters. You know, like there are, and we talked about, the, there was the, the Jason Trier report about PlayStation shifting to a focus towards just blockbusters. You know, like there, there, there is a lot of points of concern from the likes of Jim Ryan and Herman Holst that we wouldn't have seen under Sean Layden and Shuhei, etc. That I think in some ways put a potential concern around the future of PlayStation. Am, am I, this is open to both of you, am I tinfoil hatting this here? I don't think so at all. Like, I think you almost see the nail on the head where, like, that PS4 era where it seemed to have those personalities that kind of were really seemed quite approachable and knew kind of how to speak business and, like, consumer products as well. It really seemed like that era was for the players with that. Pun intended. Kind of plugging that yeah. fun that way. <laughs> yep. Whereas it seems, uh, going forward it's kind of almost taking that step back to old kind of generation sony where it's kind of more that kind of early ps3 kind of days where it's more like for the business well if if that's the the route they want to go well who knows people or the consumer will have to speak with their wallet in that regard and see if they're willing to to kind of backpedal on that but yeah it's uh it you, you're not wrong in saying that this kind of generation if you want to call it does feel a bit different to to kind of how things seem to be say five years ago and I understand, like, there is that transition and, like, new leadership does bring change. But it's especially when you look over at 
I'm not like I'm a big proponent of the not arrogant. I hate the argument of is this arrogant Sony again because I, I it just frustrates me when I hear that because it just seems very, uh, <laughs> just very uh, a contrived way to look at it, right? But you know there like there are like when you look over at Xbox and they've got the likes of Phil Spencer standing up there and essentially being what Sean Layden and True Hey was this friendly consumer facing figurehead you know and then we look over at playstation we are seeing cold-hearted uncommunicative as we talked about before you know sort of very quiet like to me that future is concerning like the decisions that they are making have me worried now max you and i have talked about these and this a number of times yeah it makes me wonder that if their personalities would come across better if they just spoke to their consumers more because they're talking so little about what what their plans are and there's so much so much time between their state of plays and their showcases they're not having a lot of time to to do that stuff they're not having that that face time with with their with their consumers with their audiences and it does make them come across as cold and to the point and very business minded whereas you you look back um when when you know when sony did participate in those big shows like the e3s when they were still happening and, and all that fun stuff and because of that shift away from it and the shift that they're making now of you know with these recent studio acquisitions and what they're working on you know i i've i've brought it up on our show before it's their silence is somewhat concerning is because you know are they silent because they've got nothing to say or they don't know how to say it like i think joel mentioned it earlier he's um maybe they're holding back on some of those things because by announcing what some studios are working on essentially puts a timer on this is when your playstation 4 will no longer get games and that is a very concerning thing for a consumer, especially in the current climate of I cannot walk into a store and purchase an upgrade now. So it, it you know, to a to a degree, it makes sense to to hold your cards and let people know at the last possible moment that hey, this hardware, you need to get something new now if you want to keep playing in this ecosystem. And the other point is as fans as consumers as as media we also want information and they're in a very hard spot right now even just something as simple as stuff's coming man chill like that would be enough instead they just stonewall that but, shit which, which but is i think me. yeah but i don't know if it would be i don't know if you if you arbitrarily throw out we have things in the work they're coming can't tell you what yet but they're coming i guess i don't the, think that we probably don't read read as genuine would you agree joe <laughs> Well, yes and no, but even like just a statement like that thrown at the end of that PlayStation showcase of like, we know you might not have seen everything you wanted to today, but put your faith in us, like it's coming kind of thing. But yeah, you guys touched it on it perfectly where their communication seems quite cold. Uh, but Sony haven't always been the strongest when it comes to kind of communication. The amount of things that I thought would be like a massive release or big deal for them often just end up on the PlayStation blog randomly one morning. Like things like release dates for like God of War, I think, was just like the first gameplay and like release date was just a blog post one morning. I'm like, these are the things you should be like showing off. And yeah, with them kind of exiting out or seeming like they're too big for E3 or don't want to be part of Gamescom also kind of removes them from wanting to be in that space where all gamers are quite excited in, during those weeks and things like that. And I'm sure they'd love to also have Sony news, but then they kind of just back out. And then when they do kind of make people wait for their own thing, and then it does somewhat underperform or doesn't meet certain people's expectations, it kind of then throws a bit of a spanner in the works as to, to what we should expect from them. Like, do we only get one big thing a year from them now? Or are they going to participate a little bit more or go back to some of these consumer shows? It's it's a little bit up in the air. So what I did is I did jump out on Twitter. I was like, hey, we're doing this show about the state of PlayStation. What do you got to say? We got a ha- we got a handful of answers. I've picked a I picked a couple of them. So uh, Dylan Blight over from the Explosion Network at Viva La Dill adds they've dropped the ball on indies and their lack of state of play slash general conversation with the PS loyal leaves a lot to be desired, especially in the face of other companies uh, like Nintendo slash Microsoft. Do you have anything to add on on those comments? Perfect. You kind of summed up exactly mm-hmm. what I've uh, like been thinking as well i mean you've been saying it for near on months now ryan at the moment there's not really a huge reason to own a playstation 5 not at all and i have one and i won the broke and i have to get a new one so like (laughs) but the best answer that we've got so far it's a longie and this came from shane bailey uh that's at magic casts on twitter uh host of the question box he goes 
almost forgot to send my novel and then he did send in fact a novel <laughs> i'll try and keep it concise as possible but my perspective on the state of playstation right now i think they're in a great place but there's plenty of room for improvement and i'd like to see them try to lead the industry in other in areas other than AAA single player action games with the way the market and the consumer expectations are changing and will continue to rapidly change i don't think the practices that they have in place right now will serve them well in five years time I'm speaking specifically to $125 AUD RRP for exclusives, inconsistent PC strategy, something that we do haven't touched on yet, uh, but we're running out of time. A uh, little variety across its first party portfolio, huge development costs, and a sub service in PlayStation Now that isn't even competitive or available in this country. It's clear they see all of these challenges and obstacles already and have been making moves to better position themselves for the future, which is great. So I'm not too concerned about anything above. Sony's competition is going to move very quickly, though, and they're going to have to leverage their strengths, uh, IP, fan loyalty, management appeal, to remain competitive in a world where, subs where sub uh, subscription services and cloud services are much more established slash are the primary way people play games, if Microsoft, Amazon, and Netflix have their way. From, from a personal perspective, if Sony would like to go get me to buy into their brand and ecosystem again, I just need a way in that makes a sense for a lifestyle. A 31-year-old adult working full-time and trying to scrape savings for a house, I can't justify spending $750 on a console only to have to then spend $125 on new exclusives when the competition is offering me dozens of new games and, uh, sorry, new release games a year, including Xbox Game Pass, Bethesda, Indies, and third-party titles across a console class and PC for only $15 a month. It's totally a self-centered position to have, but that's my reality right now. I'd love to play PS games, but even as a hardcore gamer, I can't justify the cost of entry. Having said that, if PlayStation had a Game Pass competitor that allowed me to play its exclusives on PC day one or shortly after for a similar price, they'd be getting $180 a year out of me, and I haven't spent money on a PS product in over four years. Overall, for this gamer, the PlayStation ecosystem just doesn't fit my lifestyle. And if Xbox keep, keeps on track and how it's been going, I cannot imagine changing my mind anytime soon. Love the show, boys, and thanks for the opportunity to share. Now, we're going to wrap up very quickly, but I think Shane kind of nailed it in a number of ways. Yeah, it is a, yeah, it is very, a very expensive very barrier valid. of entry. Yeah, and I mean, gaming as uh, it's entertainment, and obviously it's a privileged thing to to want to, to get into but as he grazed the perfect point is he can get that kind of experience somewhere else and get it far cheaper and and with what seems to be more value so yeah it, i don't argue with any of his points that he mm. raised and as the, he actually had a couple of really great ones there in regards to like things not available in this country and that like even some of the things that are kind of subpar compared to the competition and in other areas, Sony are actually like following the competition in regards to, to kind of being on the, the back foot around uh, like kind of copying uh, to an extent uh, to try and see if it will also work in their their uh, field. But I really do hope that they're obviously Sony are a smart company and hopefully taking all this feedback on board and do come out with some kind of showcase of not just the future of PlayStation games, but the future of PlayStation as well. And maybe do announce all these kinds of things in a little bit more pro-consumer way because that would definitely kind of sway the needle a little bit in like regards to where it currently is great points there by shane just jim.ryan at sony.com send it just <laughs> pop an email <laughs> Well, I said we are right at the end of our time, gents. Uh, I think you kind of nicely wrapped up there, Job. Is there anything you want to add in a little wrap-up? No, uh, not particularly. Not without kind of going on a, a long-winded, probably starting up another podcast, but kind of might come back another day and talk with your boys in relation to kind of like the future of Sony and how the like the studios are currently working and even like potential what kind of like going on behind the scenes because uh, there's a couple of things I'd love to talk about, but uh, obviously yeah, not with what we've got in the time remaining, but... No, it's obviously an exciting time for PlayStation still being relatively new in regards to the overall um, generation, if, even though they don't want to kind of call it that. But um, yeah, exciting times ahead. But yeah, obviously a lot of areas that we've both kind of raised, or all of us have raised that you could kind of improve on. You name the day, dude, and you're on the show. You come on our show and you can talk about, talk about <laughs> all you want. Max, what are your final thoughts? Uh, yeah, very much the same. You know, I'm, I mirrored a lot of what, what we've all spoken about tonight. And I just hope that... Sony does come to that realization that they, they need to share more information with with their fans, with their with their consumers, and just you know give us just give us something, 
you have a subscription called PlayStation Now. Give us give us something now. <laughs> Don't make us wait too long. Put the plus back in PlayStation Plus. Yeah. Well, I, I'd say in you, so. I've kind of thrown my my thoughts in in throughout as well, as I've been asking you guys the questions as well. But I think in number of ways, Sony's are fantastic, and I and I do believe that Shane is spot on in that they are they are hitting their stride. And as Paul mentioned, they are rolling from the success of the PS4. Like I'm hearing way more people wanting PS5s right now than I'm ever hearing about people wanting Xbox Series Xs. Now, am I is that because of the ecosystem that I'm a part of? <laughs> Very likely, but like. There is, there is such a strong demand for PS5. They The people are wanting there to be success. They're wanting to do well. But part of me, whether it be because of, you know, working within the game space for the better part of a decade, especially around PlayStation, I, I do wonder whether my perspective is a little bit altered in the way that I, you know, it's well, well and good to look at the future future in the likes of wolverine and and spite like which is going to be 2024 25 for sure spider-man 2 in 2023 yes there's an ounce of cool things coming in 2022 but like that's so crammed at the start of the year what does that mean for the rest of the year like sony are making the correct decisions instead of going the, the xbox route of just throwing money at things but placing but placing investments into things whether it be the likes of discord and they in a uh, investor capacity so rather than buying out discord like we'll give you money to work with us in a more communicative capacity so i think that is why you're seeing the likes of more successful second party deals with playstation because why buy the cow when you can get the milk is kind of the conversation. I know it's like really technically a sex innuendo, and they could be for all I know. But like part of it is like, well, hey, we're not going to go and buy you out. We are just going to give you money to support us and work with us, and we'll help you. You know, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know, like Square Enix have created such a lengthy amount of exclusive deals with PlayStation that would have cost them. But there is no way the PlayStation would ever buy Square Enix out. It's not possible. By this, no. But they've got exclusivity now on the output, which is what yeah, they want. Yeah, which is what, like, what, what, as, as but, Max said before, it is the perception. To most people, Final Fantasy, six, Final Fantasy 16, even if it comes to Xbox down the line, is a PlayStation game. I know, as the current slogan is, it's the place to play. And I do still think that it is. And I think they're doing the right... They're, 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 in some ways, they are doing the right calls to continue it to be the, the right place to play. However... They are lagging behind in a number of ways that I think are actually detrimental to the future of the company. Will that make? Will they ever go under? Probably not. Not. Not now. Not in our recent, in near lifetimes. Right. It's got. They're not going to just suddenly sink. This is going to be a a Sega moment. Right. They've got. They've got still got a little bit of life <laughs> in them. Yep. But there are there are 100 percent reasons to be concerned. Whether it be from a managerial perspective, whether it be a focus perspective. Uh, whether it be just from that customer facing perspective they have a right groundwork and they really could make some changes to get it going and to continue to be that dominating force uh within the consoling space because i also really enjoy xbox chasing them because the competitive market is a good market the ps4 was great but it wasn't as fun when, when xbox weren't there to compete yeah fantastic joel C agree completely that brings us to the end where can they find you my friend uh, so you can find my uh, written works and reviews up on uh, website anygame.com but there you can either follow me uh, on Twitter as well at anygame underscore au that's it so that's a-n-i dash g-a-m-e dot com dot au correct uh, not dot au dot com. com so if you want yep. your anime you, you want it. your games he's your man to go to now Max I'm going to let you do the spiel for our show but yeah thank you so uh, give us the run give us the rundown of the show that you and I do each and every week well guys if you want to hear more <laughs> of us you can check us out live on at, on Saturdays at 4 p.m. on twitch.tv slash the pop cultures for for the players the pop cultures PlayStation podcast you can also find that on podcast services of choice at 8 a.m. on Mondays and 9 a.m. on YouTube that's youtube.com slash the pop cultures come and say good day we've got all our socials Facebook Discord Instagram Twitter all of those links and all that all that fun stuff you can find me at be possessed on Twitter you can find Ryan at, at haggard MC on Twitter or you know at the pop culturist come and check us out yeah so big thank you to the t for not just pax australia for allowing us to come in here uh th thank you to the team at audio technica and brendan white for hitting us up uh to get involved in uh pax radio hopefully uh we'll be able to do this live and in, in person next year 
fingers crossed. Uh, but additionally, over the PAX weekend, uh, if you want to hear me and other things, I'm also joining uh, Radio Watson for PAX Radio, and I'm also involved in a panel that appear that will be appearing on the PAX Oz uh, Twitch channel, which is about mental health and video games in terms of the benefit of them coming together. So check that out too. Anyways, we're going to move it on to the next show. Big thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you guys for joining us. And also, shout out to Patch, who came through earlier. He's at Paul James Games. Also, player2.net.au is where you can check him out. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be involved in PAX once again. And we hope to all see you in there, in person, next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>